Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You're a... And you've lost your... Oh. Archie, the answer is no. Hold on a second. The answer to what is no, Mr. Wolf? I shall not attempt to find a blonde for anyone. You've got the man on the phone a little wrong, Mr. Wolf. He's not looking for a blonde. He's looking for a prize fighter. <laughs> Indeed. Have him come here. Okay. Mr. Wolf will see you at eight. So long. I was all set to argue with you about taking the case. You, you gave in too fast. Nonsense. I'm fascinated by the thought of anyone misplacing a prize fighter. They're usually quite large, aren't they? They are. But what this guy is worried about is not only finding his boy, but finding him alive. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. The case of the deadly sellout. That's what my boss, Nero Wolf, called it. And it almost meant curtains for the firm of Wolf and Goodwin. But let me give it to you straight right from the beginning. Although you ought to know that it wasn't until it was all over that I knew the very beginning of it myself. It all started in the New York flat of one Brock Rainey. Yes? The name is Jerry Fay. I'm supposed to know you? Being a very good friend of Pepe Gatto's, it's time you got to know me. May I come in? Oh, sure. You've got a problem, Miss Fay? Pepe took a fall at the garden last night against a coffee and bum named Eubanks. Right? As far as I know, Sister Gatto met his match. Please, Mr. Rainey, do me a favor. Skip the sausage meat. It happens I saw the 1200 bucks you counted out to him to take a quick dive in the first. Mm, you did. How else would I know? Okay, then here's my wrist. Slap it, Miss Fay. I'm a bad boy. Now, look, who's kidding who? I don't care if Peppy makes himself a few deals on the side. I should worry whether he gives those meat eaters on the benches a run for the ducats. What's it to me? If you're not worried, Sugar Plum, then neither am I. Also, I'm a very busy man. Not too busy to pay off, I hope. Pay off? To who? To me. For what? For keeping it to myself that you collected five grand from the Eubanks crowd for getting Peppy to take that dive. Certain people might not like to hear it. Miss Fay. Yeah? Drop dead. I don't think we understand each other. Which is just as well. Now get out of here. something Blow, else. bimbo. Okay, Mr. Rainey. Have it your way. I'll go find someone with a more sympathetic ear. Someone like Lorson. Arnold F. Lorson. So long. Wait. Where does Lawson come into this? You asking a stalling. Lawson dropped a sizable piece of change on last night's two-step. No. Close the door, Jerry. Oh, yeah. $25,000 to be exact. That's a lot of corn to lose because a cheap fight manager arranges a frame. At least Arnold Lawson might think so. Sit down. Who's tired? Look, Mr. Rainey, it goes very simply in only one way. Lawson at yet knows from nothing except that your boy Gatto lost the fight. He may suspect, but he don't know. And he really don't have to know. Glad to hear you say that. And I'll be glad to see the shade of 3,000 long green banknotes. How much? You heard me, three grand. Get out. Okay, I'm going. To the next phone and call Lawson. Look, Jerry, give me time, huh? I haven't got that kind of dough right now. I Tell gotta... it to Lawson. When he gets through with you, you won't need any kind of dough. You know, I've got Gatto set for a go with Mellish, the title contender. Gatto can take him. Please believe me, he's going to take him. So? So after what happened in the Eubanks fight, the odds on Gatto will be like a war debt. We can clean up. Listen, we can make Listen, Neil, a... I wouldn't trust you from 11.59 to midnight. Get it up. Now. I'll give you six hours. After that, Lawson. So long. <laughs> Come on, come on. Hello? 
Hello, Rainey, this is Gatto. Hiya, Fabby. Look, the boys dropped in on me at the office at Mindy's. Lawson wants to see me. What? Lawson? Look, bum, I'm the one with the cauliflower ears. You heard me, and what do I do? Nothing. But... Don't but... go near him. Stay home. Let me take care of it. How? How? I what do you do? I don't know yet, Papi, but I'll find a way. How did he find out? Your girlfriend. What? She wouldn't do that. She hates the guy. Hate him or love him, she told him. I, I can't believe it. I... I suggest you call our little doll Jerry and give her your regards for the double cross. Meanwhile, stay put in your apartment. Don't move. But, Rainy... Hello. Hello. Seventy-five, three, three nineteen, three. Archie, mm-hmm. what on earth are you mumbling about? The high cost of blunt. Indeed. Oh, you can say that again. I have no intention of doing so. Okay, be smug. But there must have been a time even in your life when knickknacks from Tiffany figured on the budget. Phooey. Uh, not to mention steak dinners and champagne. Or what did you feed your girls? Peppermint lozenges? Nonsense. Nonsense. They preferred lime. Oh, I'm dying and he laughs. Mr. Wolf? Yes? I have decided that you are giving me a raise. Archie, this is not a period in which uh, unilateral decisions are wise. So I'll be a dope and get a raise, huh? As for your future mental attainments, you may be right. As for raise... You want to drive me to gambling? Like betting on fights or going... Okay, it's the doorbell and I'm answering it. The name's Rainey. You're Goodwin? I'm Goodwin. Come in. Is Wolf in? Mr. Wolf is always in. Unlike prize fighters, I guess. Come on. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Rainey, the man who lost his prize fighter. How do you do, sir? I'm not doing so good. Mr. Wolf, you gotta help me. That would depend. On what? The fee. <laughs> I digress. Your problem is what, Mr. Rainey? Mr. Wolf, I manage a fighter named Gatto. Maybe you've heard of him. I have not. However, that is of little significance. You are having difficulty with this Mr. Gatto? I'm not having difficulty with him. I can't find him. Uh, maybe you better let me give you the whole picture, huh? Very well. Well, Gatto is an up-and-coming boy, Mr. Wolf. He had a little upset last week with a guy named Eubanks. But everybody knows in spite of that, Gatto's heading for the big time. I think he'll prove that when he goes against Mellish. Mr. Mellish being another pugilist, huh? Oh, that's right, Mr. Wolf. Now, Peppy, that's Gatto. Peppy was due at the turf club this afternoon to meet the opposition management and go over the setup. He was due, but he didn't show. I waited all afternoon, and then I started the phone calls and taxis. The results? No results. I combed every joint I ever knew him to buy a beer in, and the score was zero. Matter of fact, nobody's even seen him for four days. You would have tried the gymnasiums, naturally? I did. Does this pugilist have a home? Yeah, 206 A Rathburn Street, a penthouse on the roof. He was not at home during all this time? It's where I tried first. It was empty as a bank on Saturday afternoon. I see. And you want me to find him for you? If Pepe blows this fight, Mr. Wolf, it'll ruin his career. And the preservation of his career is worth a good deal to you? I got a check for two grand right here. Archie? I'll get it. Two thousand dollars. Very well, Mr. Rainey, I should take immediate steps. I got a cab waiting outside. We can get started right away. We? Oui. <laughs> I should remain here. But how do you expect to... Archie? Yes, Mr. Wolf. You will leave with Mr. Rainey. I need information. You might try the Rathburn Street penthouse to start with. But I've already been there. With all your apologies, Mr. Rainey, suppose you restrict your activities to pugilists. Archie is a trained observer. You are not. Archie, you will pick up whatever you can at Gatto's apartment. I especially suggest a careful check on his wardrobe. Wardrobe? If his clothes are missing, Mr. Rainey, it would indicate that he left voluntarily and deliberately. For whatever reasons he may have had. They are not. Archie, you will phone me from the apartment after your investigation is over. Okay. I shall, in the meantime, devote some thought to the subject. Huh? For two grand, all you're going to do is devote some thought? Mr. Rainey, if I were not a modest man, I would point out to you that you're getting quite a... <laughs> a bargain. Bargain. <laughs> 
Gatto? Gatto? He's not here. I told you that. I was up here before. He left the door unlocked? I had a key. Guess I forgot to lock up after I left. Now, let's look around. Bathroom? Yeah. Hmm. Empty. It's a nice penthouse. Better closet? Yeah. What do you think? He's playing hide and seek? Try it. Okay. Anything in there? Nothing I'm looking for. What's that you found? A hat. Well, let's see. A lady's hat. Yeah, a smart and expensive. Label reads a Madam Yetta original. <laughs> that bunch of lace and feathers cost somebody a fast half a hundred. Yeah, probably one of those girls left it behind. And maybe she'll call for it. Come on, we'll take a gander out on the roof. I took a gander out there. It's bare as a bone. Uh-uh. What have we got over there with the chimney? Where? Over there. Uh, just an old awning. Got blown down the storm last month. Yeah. Be right with you. What are you doing? Looking under it. Oh, brother. You, you found him? Yeah, we found him, chum. A little late. Two holes in his dorsal development and dead as a clay pigeon. Yeah. Well, what have you got to say? Well, now at least the bookies will cancel all bets. We both save our dough. Yeah. I got a phone, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> And there he was, Mr. Wolf, under the old canvas awning. Hmm. Where's the hat? Oh, this is it. Mm-hmm. That's it, boss. <laughs> Snazzy number, no? Where'd you find it? On the floor of the closet. You're right, Archie. Frothy little bit of millinery, caprice. Mm-hmm. Have you any idea whose it may be, Mr. Rainey? I wish I did. But you have to find out. Well, how, mm-hmm. boss? The hat is an original. See? The label under the band reads a Madame Yetta original. Tomorrow morning, Archie, you will interview Madame Yetter. Yes, boss. And discover in your inimitable fashion for whom she made this chapeau. Hello? Archie again, Mr. Wolf. Per your instructions, I have just talked to Madame Yetter. What did you learn? Madame Yetter tells me she made that hat for a Mrs. Lawson. Who is Mrs. Lawson? Wife of an ex-beer hustler is in the chips and puts on airs. Lives in a penthouse of the Bradford Arms. I was just about to hop a cab and go up there, boss. Good. Keep this up, Archie. And through sheer practice, you may yet develop a full-blown intelligence. Well, I'm trying, Mr. Wolf. And after the Lorsons, I do what? Return here immediately and hurry. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Goodwin. My secretary tells me you're a detective. My boss might argue with you on that, Mr. Larson. Your boss? It happens I work for Nero Wolf. I see. And you wish to see me about... About this hat. Hat? Oh, I see, yeah. Well, Mr. Goodwin, please believe me. I never wear hats like that. Would your wife be likely to say the same? My wife? Just what are you getting at? Would I seem too nosy if I asked how well you and your wife know Pepe Gatto? How well do we know who? Pepe Gatto. The pug? No, no, not such a pug. No, huh? <laughs> I lost 25000 on him in the Eubanks fight. If you ask me, he laid down like a dog. And did you talk it over with him? Talk it over with him? Never seen the man in my life. Not even at the fight? No, I placed a bet over the telephone. I'd scarcely have anything to do with a character like Gatto, Mr. Goodwin. You surely won't from here on out, Mr. Larson. What do you mean? Gatto is dead. You don't say he was murdered last night. Murdered? And what would you say, Mr. Lorson, if I told you that this hat is your wife's and that it was found in a closet in Gatto's apartment? Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Are you implying... Not implying. That... Facts are sticking out. What time was this dumb brute done away with? Oh, I'd set it at somewhere between 5 and 7 p.m. last night. Well, you said it very conveniently. Thanks. Why? My wife and I drove out of the city at 4.30 yesterday afternoon. Didn't get back until two this morning. And this hat? It took wings and flew into Gatto's closet? Is that the answer? No, that's not the answer. Then what is? This is. A month and a half ago, I was with Celia on a bus top. 
She was wearing that hat, and the wind blew it off her head. I see. And from there, we figure that somebody picked it up, and it finally wound up at Gotham. You can figure anything you please. Personally, I don't feel in any way obligated to figure anything. Darling, I was just on my way out, and... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were busy. Yes, I am busy, Celia. Wait a minute. He's not all that Run along now, dear. You'll be late. But I want to talk to you. Run along, Celia. Yes, darling. Sorry. I'll see you later. Beautiful. Really beautiful. I've always thought so, Goodwin. You, uh, didn't give me much of a chance to talk to her, did you, Larson? If I didn't, it's for your own good. My good? I don't get it. Celia's a sensitive person, and I won't have her bothered. And do you mean to tell me you let him scare you? Let him scare me? Say, will you stop being so fearless with my life? The guy said, don't bother my wife, so I didn't bother his wife. It was that simple. Apparently, his wife was not blonde. Answer the phone, Archie. No, you answer it. Now, you've hurt my feelings. Oh, well. Hello? I want to speak to Mr. Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf speaking. Oh? Is it true that you're interested in the Gatto murder? Who are you, and how do you know he's been murdered? The second question is none of your business. And as for the first, call me Jerry. J-E-R-I. How do you do, Jerry? J-E-R-I. Where do you call? Would you like to come to an auction? An auction? You know, going, going, gone to the highest bidder. And what are you placing on the auction block, Miss Jerry? A few facts. All in good condition and guaranteed to make it a cinch to snag the Gatto killer. Sounds promising. Only you'll have to bid against real money. May I have the address of the auction room? You'll have no trouble finding it. Your assistant was there last night. Where? The penthouse on top of 206A Rathburn Street. The big item goes on at four bells. Yeah? Who is it? Man in Wolf sent me. Just a sec. Hmm. You're Jerry, huh? I was expecting the man named Wolf. Unfortunately for me, honey, when he's expected, I usually show up. Come on in. You? See, I'm the legs of the combination. He's the brains. It makes uh, makes a nice division of labor. I see. You came in plenty of time. On the nose is our custom. Where are the rest of the bidders? Any second now. Mm-hmm. How many besides me are coming? One. Small auction. But big action. How'd you happen to decide on this? I knew Gatto pretty good. And you were fond of him pretty good, huh? How did you guess? Well, you've got a key to this place of his, or you couldn't let yourself in. It adds, no. Gee, you should have been a detective. Just what I keep telling Mr. Wolf. Look, tell me, Jerry, darling, this other person who is coming to the auction, who? The killer. You don't say. You sure the killer isn't here already? Look, I didn't kill him. Ah. The story you would like me to believe is that you witnessed the killing, huh? Called the killer and Mr. Wolf and said, Come on, kids, you can get me either to talk or shut up, depending on who pays the most, then it? Something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, prove you know what you're talking about. Who is the killer? Is it Block Rainey? Should also have your head examined, pretty boy. I talk for dough and only for dough. Not that I'm mercenary or anything, okay. but... Okay. Okay, tell me this. How come you saw the killer in the act? Simple. I was here with Gatto. Called me to come see him. While I was here, the shot came through the window there from the roof. You know something, sweetheart? What? I can't understand how a girl like you, a pretty nice girl under all that uh, paint and powder and Broadway shellac, how you could do a thing like this. You were in love with Gatto, I know that, everybody does. And still you're willing to keep your mouth shut if the killer pays enough. How come? Hmm? What's the matter, honey? Did I hit a tender spot? I... I don't think you understand. Sure, I was in love with the goof. Then along comes this other dame. She's rich and beautiful, and she has everything to give him. Oh, do I know her? Of course you do. She... Oh! Jerry! Uh... Oh! Jerry. She was just about to tell me, and then the shot came through the window from the roof, boss. It's a flat roof outside. You didn't, I suppose, see the murderer? No. I caught Jerry in my arms by the time I laid her down on the couch and got out on the roof. The killer was gone. 
Get right over here and bring our client with you, if you can find him. Rainey? That's right. He has a right to be in on the kill. Okay, boss. But keep away from that beer till I get there. Don't be impertinent. I should be busy phoning Mr. and Mrs. Lawson. Meanwhile, I want them here, too. Besides, one bottle won't do any harm. Ah, oh, there they are. Let them in, Archie. You remain seated, Mr. Rainey. Okay, Mr. Wolf. Well, come in, Mr. Lawson. Come in. Mr. Wolf here? He's here. Nice of you to come. Anything to help the law. Ah, Mr. Lawson. Your wife didn't come. Uh, no, Mr. Wolf. She was out when you called. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. I left word with the butler, however. Mr. Lawson, about 20 minutes ago, a girl named Jerry Faye was killed. So? She was killed in your neighborhood, in the flat formerly occupied by one Pepe Gato. Well, where would that be? Maybe your wife knows where the flat would be. How dare you, sir? No histrionics, please. Where was your wife when the girl was killed? I'm advising you that if there is an alibi, now's the time to state it. I wouldn't humiliate Celia by alibying for her. Then the police will pick her up. But she didn't kill this girl, Mr. Wolf. You have reasons for that opinion? The best of reasons. I'd be grateful if you'd state them and let me be the judge of their excellence. Well, one should do. This one. Celia's out in the country visiting her mother. No. Oh. Does that settle it? Possibly. What's her mother's telephone number? Why, uh... Merely a routine check. Well, can't you take my word? I'll take her mother's number. Well, Mr. Lawson? I'm sorry. I I hoped you'd buy this story. What do you mean? The mother's been dead for ten years. I see. Well, I don't. What's the idea? It's known as marital devotion, Archie. <laughs> I suppose you realize, Mr. Lawson, that in shielding your wife, you're aiding and abetting a murderer? I, I haven't stopped to realize anything. When Goodwin brought me that hat, I didn't know what to say. Oh, you pitched me a curve then, too. Well, I suppose you might call it that, but... And she didn't lose the chapeau off a bus top. No, but you've got to understand. Celia's the dearest thing in life to me. Yeah, so is a lady rattlesnake to its husband. I suggest it is time for you to be objective in this matter, Mr. Lawson. What do you want to know? Tell us where she can be found. I, I have no idea. When is she expected to return home? Never. Oh? Uh -huh. You see, we, we had an argument. I doubt that I'll ever see her again. Then we are quite on our own, Archie. To do what? To make a journey to Gatto's apartment. Gatto's apartment? She probably has a key to that popular abode. But she wouldn't go there, boss. On the contrary, I am of the opinion that that's just where she would go. Give me my hat. Don't tell me you're going to stir yourself. Ah, it's a most unpleasant necessity, Archie. But the lady in question is dangerous and not at all hesitant about indiscriminate gunplay. Get out the car, Archie. We'll make the journey to Rathburn Street penthouse with the hope that Celia Lawson will show up in time to mourn her lost love. Uh, uh, you want me to go along with you too, Mr. Wolf? Yes, indeed, Mr. Rainey, I do. Uh, I trust this chair will hold me. Should. Biggest chair in the house. Mr. Wolf. Yes, Mr. Reening? Mr. Wolf, am I to understand that the way you have it figured is that Mrs. Lawson killed Gatto, and then to keep the girl from pinning the crime on her, she killed her too? What's the matter, Mr. Reening? Don't you think the theory holds water? Well, yes. I, I mean, of course it does. Mm, thank you. On the other hand, there is room for doubt. I'm glad to hear you say that, Mr. Wolf. Would you mind explaining? I'll explain, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Goodwin was in this room when Jerry Fay was killed. Right, Archie? Right, boss. He ran as quickly as he could out onto the roof, but your wife was nowhere in evidence. What difference does that make? A good deal, I'd say. Wouldn't you, Archie? Yes, a detail like that would give a jury room for doubt. Oh, don't be a fool. How so, Rainey? Well, I was about to agree with Rainey. I, I mean, on sheer logic. I'm afraid I miss your point, Mr. Lawson. Well, what if Goodwin didn't see her? That proves nothing. She fired the shots and then she ran down the fire escape. What fire escape? The one a few feet beyond the chimney. Mr. Lawson. Yes? Who told you there was a fire escape there? Why, uh... Yeah, I... Yeah, who did? You can't see it from here, Lawson. Well, I, I just imagine there might be. Sensationally accurate imagination, Mr. Lawson. Allow me to congratulate you. I don't know what you have in mind. You have in mind to see your wife convicted of the murder of Pepe Gatto. 
And so punish them both for having dared to fall in love. I love Celia. I worship her. Yes, that's what you expected me to believe. Hoping, meanwhile, that a hat would convict her. You worshipped her until she became fascinated by a young savage animal known as Pepe Gatto. No. At that point, the worship shifted into reverse, and you went green with hate. Hate that drove you to climb that fire escape that you know so much about and shoot him in the back. You're dreaming. Jerry Faye saw you in the act. And when she was about to divulge your identity to Archie, you killed her too. Meaning to hang her murder on your wife along with the other killing. That's a lie. Mr. Lawson, I didn't bring you here to apprehend your wife. There's really no reason why she should come here. I suggested this visit in the belief that you'd betray some guilty knowledge of the place and circumstances. As you have so obligingly just done. You're clever, aren't you? Monumentally. But a little hasty. So, why? This gun in my hand. I haven't you noticed. <laughs> of course, sir, but yours is not the only gun in the world. What? Sit still, Arnold. And don't turn around. Your wife, Mr. Lawson. Come in, my dear. Celia. What are you doing here? I came to get a hat that I'd left in Pepe's closet. It suddenly was clear to me what was in the wind. And I thought I'd better remove all evidence that you could possibly use against me. Celia, listen, you must understand I understand you... one thing only. Pepe's gone. And you took him away. Listen, please, if you let me explain, you'll understand. Yeah. Please, honey, help me. Sure, I'll help you. Oh, uh... Celia. Well, that's all, Mr. Wolf. What now? Archie, why is it when you drive it always gets so crowded outside? Will it go tough on her, boss? Why not? She killed a man in cold blood. Though she actually saved our lives while doing so. I hope that helps her at the trial. I hope so, Archie. After all, if she hadn't done what she did, what would have happened to the lobster beast? What lobster beast? The lobster beast that Fritz is making for dinner. <laughs> Hurry, Archie. It really can't be appreciated unless it's eaten hot. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Ann Diamond, Charlotte Lawrence, Gerald Moore, Don Diamond, and Eddie Fields. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Killer Card. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Saturday night is date night, and NBC has a lively lineup of music and fun to help your courting along. Tomorrow, Dennis Day brings you a melodic and mirthful 30 minutes, and then Judy Canova gets together with her gang for a sparkling session of mountain-style song and laughter, followed by singing MC Red Foley and his friends on that exciting parcel of Western tunes and mayhem Grand Ole Opry. Here's Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Wolf? Yeah, he's right here. Who's this? Archie, hang up. Don't ask questions. You, uh, you have a what? Archie, it's past your bedtime. Well, I'm afraid, Mr. Wolf, uh, it's past his bedtime. Your bedtime. It's a client, boss. That's what I was afraid of. Foolish. Hello? Hello? Well, why do you look so bewildered? He's coming right over. He says he's got a date. With murder. Ladies and gentlemen, 
gentlemen, is the detective genius who rates the knife and fork the greatest tools ever invented by man. The founders, brilliant and unpredictable Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's story, The Case of the Calculated Risk, was as strange and baffling as any Nero Wolf had to deal with. It started late one night when a big-shouldered man sporting a reddish beard and billing himself as Dave Caffrey pushed his way in, walked up to Nero Wolf's desk, and rocked him with this opener. Tomorrow morning, Mr. Wolf, I'm going to kill a man. I beg your pardon, sir? I'm going to kill a man with these two hands. I've been told strange things across this desk, Mr. Caffrey. This is the first time a murderer has confided his intention to me in advance. This man you speak of... I'm not telling you his name. I'm not telling you where I'm going to meet him. This session tomorrow is going to be private and personal. But if anything happens to me between now and then, I want you to take over. Mr. Gaffrey, do you seriously think I could assist you in a matter of private vengeance? That's not what I'm asking. This guy deserves to die. I plan to kill him with these two hands, me, myself. But if I slip up, if he gets me first... Now, I want you to see that justice is done. And I assure you, sir... I told you this guy deserves to die. Let me tell you why. Years ago, down south, there were three men in business together, partners. Me and two others. You know, Bugacci, if Mr. Gaffrey doesn't mind... You're wasting your time, Wolf. The names I'll use will be phony. I won't give you anything you can check back on. We'll take our chance, sir. Please proceed. It happened in a town about 40 miles from the place where we had our business. We'd gone there to collect some money, the three of us. Carl, Mitch, and me. Dave Caffrey. But all we collected was bad news. So bad that Carl hadn't even given our right names at the hotel. Said he was scared some of our creditors would come hitting up on us for what we owed. Three of us had had some drinks, and we'd been pacing around for nearly an hour. I can still remember the way Mitch stood and looked at me. And then up at Carl... When Carl suddenly pulled to a stop and came out with this idea of his. Even so, Dave. You've got 6,000 cash on hand. You counted it, Mitch. Well, didn't we make it 6240, Carl? Whichever. We've got this 6,000 odd, plus some slow accounts receivable against debts of 38,000. With three of us trying to live from the business, we haven't got a chance. Well, we ain't got much of a one, Carl, but. It's hopeless, Dave. With two partners, though. Two partners? You reckon on pulling out, Carl? I say we cut card for it, Mitch. Low man drops out. Break up the partnership? After sticking together all these oh, years? Oh, wait a minute, Dave. Wait a minute. Maybe Carl's right. Maybe this could work. Carl, you mean the low man drops out clean? Right now? Right now, Mitch. Other two to take over assets and debts and see if they can get this thing back in the black. Okay, Carl. Get the cards out. Dave? Well, that's what you guys want. Okay, then. Here's a new deck. Shuffle them, Mitch. All shuffled. Cut them, Dave. Go ahead, Mitch. You get first pick. Spread them if you like. Here goes. Ah, six. Your turn, Dave. Okay. Nine o'clock. Hey, lucky guy, Dave. I put you in uh, whatever car pulls. I'll pull it fast. There she is. Denise. Sorry, Mitch. That leaves you elected. Well, Mitch, I'm sorry, too. I guess we all had a fair whack at it, but... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me see that ace again, Carl. Easy, Mitch. I said I was sorry, Look, but... Dave. Yeah, what is it, Mitch? All the aces are marked. <laughs> Carl, I'm going to cram this dick right down your crooked throat. Oh, Look out, Mitch. He's got a knife. Sure. Oh. Carl, you... All right. I've cut him for keeps. What do we do now? What do we do? Look, Carl, I, I didn't mark those cards. I, I didn't kill Mitch. And what's more... Shut up, I... Dave. We're both in and out now. Come on. Let's get out of here. Now, now what, Carl? Look, Dave. This is where we split up. Two men together are easy to trace. You head one way, I go the other. Yeah, but the door, I... I got no money. Here. I'll split up the 6,000. This is your hair. Here, stick the envelope in your pocket. Now, grab that tray. Get set. 
I'll catch the next one going the other way. Get going, Dave. And that's how it was, Mr. Wolf. It all happened so fast that I... Mm, this man you call Carl, <laughs> he would seem to be one of the world's choice creatures, Mr. Geoffrey. When I thought to look in that envelope he gave me, I found $40 and a few folds of wrapping paper in it. I was mad enough to... Well, I got off the freight and intended to go back, but... Then I picked up a paper. And read all about the murder of your friend Mitch with the statement that Carl had accused you of the crime. And that the police believed him in view of your escape. That's it. Classical, but not at all original. Well, I was young then and stupid. And I'd had those drinks to start with. And you spent the intervening years hunting down the man Carl, am I correct? Yeah. I tramped the country from east to west, from north to south. Tramped it for years, searching for him. And yesterday, I located him. He's a big wheel these days up on that 37th floor of his. But tomorrow, when I get... Yes, to... Mr. Caffrey, the 37th floor of... Never mind what building. Now, wait a minute, Caffrey. If you expect Mr. Wolf to help you... I you... don't want him to help me. I'll help myself. But if I slip off, I know Wolf's reputation well enough to know that he'll never rest till this, this rotten, chiseling murderer is sitting in the chair. That's why I've come here. Just to provide a backstop in case my dear friend of long ago manages to get the best of me. How will we know? You see this envelope? Read what it says. Nero Wolf, 601 West 35th Street, New York. Delivered to him in case of my death. That's right. And this envelope was $500. Nearly all I've got in the world. Along with it, the full details on that knife. Real names, dates. The proof you'll need in case I don't finish it up. Go on. Tonight, Mr. Wolf. I'm going to give this envelope to the manager of the hotel where I'm stopping. I'm calling on, well, Carl. Tomorrow at noon, right after his secretary goes to lunch. If I'm not back in my hotel at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the hotel manager will deliver this envelope to you. Is that clear? Perfectly. But you don't think I'm going to allow you to go through with this wire plan, do you? You can't stop me. And don't have Goodwin follow me. I'd lose him in two blocks. Good night. Shall I try to tail him, boss? No use, Archie. Get Inspector Kramer on the phone at once. I want the police to help us head off this murder. Nero Wolf speaking. It's Archie. I'm calling from the morgue. And? They found Caffrey's body in a subway washroom, mugged and stabbed. Wallet gone, pockets cleaned out, no envelope. Just two hours ago, he was here. No envelope, eh? Witnesses? None so far. Homicide's calling it straight mugging and robbery. As it well might look, except for... Except for a guy named Carl. How much do I tell Kramer? All of it. Ask the inspector to start queries throughout the South on the original killing. The original killing? Look... It's our best chance of getting a description of the man called Carl. The original killing and the partnership. Starting from, say, eight years ago and working back to the middle 20s. Tell him to concentrate on towns and railway lines. Putting out pictures of Caffrey and... Pictures and dentistry. Fingerprints to Washington. Kramer will know. And if I come across a haystack, do I keep my eye out for needles? We are going to find Carl, Archie. We are going to find him if it takes him now till doomsday. Mr. Wolf, let's face it, we're licked. Licked, Archie? Three days now. We found Caffrey's hotel here in New York. No traceable phone calls. Not a witness has turned up on that subway washroom party. And Kramer says he's getting nowhere with those answers from the Southland. The original story is bound to come slowly, Archie. We are asking a check on the unsolved killings of a dozen states over a 20-year period. Mm. And what now? You start trudging, Archie. Trudging? Through office buildings, through 37 floors of many office buildings. You keep trudging till we find him. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. This is a big city, remember? I might have to go through hundreds of buildings. This morning, Archie, the municipal reference library informed me that there are exactly 34 buildings of 37 floors or higher in Manhattan. Now, when you rule out the United Nations building, hotels Okay, and... okay. Maybe not so many 37 floors, but lots of offices per floor. Maybe 40 or 50. Call it 30 times 40, and you've still got uh, uh, 1,200 to start with. And you don't know what kind of business, you don't know what Carl's real name is, you don't even know what he looks like. There could be 4,000 men like him. 4,000 affluent men, aren't you? 
Yeah, well, all right. <laughs> Caffrey said he was in the chips, though. You know, for a guy who'd been bumming around, that could mean anything from ten grand a year up. Say, wait a minute, that cuts your field to a thousand. A thousand tall, man? Tall? I've been over those notes. Caffrey didn't say he was tall. As plainly as you could ask. Caffrey was almost your height, but he said Mitch stood and looked at me. And then he looked up at Carl. Up, Archie. That makes Carl your height or taller. Yeah. Well, maybe Caffrey and Mitch were sitting down and Carl was... Uh... Caffrey told us the three were standing at the time. Check your notes. I've studied them. Okay. Maybe that does cut it down some. Yeah, it's still a lot of citizens that start checking for a southern accent. Don't rely on accent, Archie. Carl has had many years to lose any accent he might have had. Yeah, that's true. And so we narrow it, Archie. A man almost surely tall. A man not using the name he was born with. A man with an unexplained gap in his past. I ought to be able to reach right out and tap him. You go skeptical again, Archie. Well, it's still a pretty big haystack. Let's see if we can't trim it some more. On these building lists I've been going over, I've ruled out for now the members of professions requiring lengthy formal training. Medical men, lawyers, scientists of most kinds. Yeah, that's chopping it down. I'll admit that. I'll have further eliminations as we get into it. And I'm putting soil pans on a second list this afternoon. Some of the credit references I'll handle by phone. So I start trudging, huh? You start trudging. And remember, Archie, since you'll probably be operating through secretaries, you are looking for a murderer named Carl, not for a new set of telephone numbers to brighten your winter. Tall? Well, I don't know what you're peddling, Goodwin, but if my boss put his elevator shoes on and stood on a box... He'd still be down somewhere around my necktie. If he stood on his money, though, we'd need a helicopter to get up near his shoelaces. Oh, Miss Jonas, do you mind if I sit down? Why, of course not, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, thanks. You know, I've been in 12 offices on this floor, and you're the first girl who's seen the importance of this survey first crack out of the box. Uh. Well, I'm sort of new here, and, and I try to pay attention. Oh, when... you're not just beautiful. You've got a head on you. Is Mr. McLean in? Well, he's at lunch right now. Lunch? But... Oh, that reminds me. Know any good restaurants up this way? Well, I was just going to the downstairs drugstore myself, but I wouldn't say Well, that... come on. Put your bonnet on and let's skip the drugstore. <laughs> this meal is on the Executive Resources Survey. Yeah, boss, the boil down. Tinsley, McLean, Fernandes, Tessero, and Kaplan. All five of them tall, all five a little misty in the background. You and Saul have done well, Archie. Very well. But I'm crossing off Fernandes and Kaplan. Why? The Credit Bureau report clears Fernandes, and Kaplan was on a special war job. The FBI x-rayed his record twice. Leaving J.P. Tinsley, Carson McLean, and Philip Tesro, huh? I'd like to see all three here, Archie. Get them here one way or another. And so you do admit that Tinsley isn't your real name. Mr. Wolf, are you a blackmailer or what? I'm a licensed private investigator, sir. Any disclosure you make will be kept in confidence, provided it doesn't touch on the case I'm engaged on. You haven't said what the case is. I don't intend to. If you prefer to explain this mysterious gap in your background at the district attorney's office... Well, I'm using the name Tinsley because I've got an undivorced first wife out on the coast. We broke up 20 years ago, but uh, she said she'd see to it that I never married again. And she knew where I was today. Well, I, I don't say I'm a saint, but uh, she's a vindictive woman. I see. May I have names, dates, and places starting 1924? I can't quite understand your interest, Mr. Wolf. It's rather complicated, to put it briefly, Mr. McLean. I'm working in the interest of a client. Our people have found this puzzling gap in your background, and I'd appreciate such clarification as you may be able to supply. But I told you, Mr. Goodwin, I was raised and educated in the Orient. Until 32, I was in business with my father in China. 
Where you say your father died? Died. With the Depression, I returned to New York, started this importing business in a small way, weathered through the early 30s, and I think my bankers can assure you of my standing today. They've done so. Carson, McLean, and company has an excellent credit rating. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. To switch somewhat abruptly, Mr. McLean, would you happen to remember how you spent the evening of the 19th? Of this month? Of this month. Well, I could hardly... Wait. You say the 19th. Would that have been on a Tuesday? Yes, it was Tuesday. Well, that simplifies it. I'm nearly always at the office on Tuesday nights dictating the revisions in our weekly wholesalers lists. Let me see. Yes, I was there on the 19th. Had a tray sent in. Miss Tunis and I worked till just after midnight. Miss Helen Tunis. The secretary Mr. Goodwin spoke of. She's been with me for two or three months. Miss Tunis can confirm this dictation on the night of the 19th? Of course. And Mr. Wolfe, your manner is so persuasive that I'd scarcely realize you're asking some extraordinary searching questions. May I ask why in the world... You... If you'll indulge me, Mr. McLean, my prying is nearly concluded. You say you were in China until 1932. Mr. Tesro, I'll be brutally frank. We know that your name's not Tesro. And we know that you served a prison term from 34 to 38 for arson. I'd like some straight answers. I didn't say I wouldn't answer your questions. The past can remain your own, provided... Now, look, Mr. Wolf, I've been going straight for 12 years. And this business of mine is on the level. Now, if this is a shakedown... Or... I'm asking where you were on the night of the 19th. And I'm telling you I stayed in town. I ate alone. And I went to a movie. I caught the 11.35 for Stanford. And that's all there is to it. You're denying that you were ever in business in the South? I was born in the South, but I haven't been back there since I was a kid. What about the arson? I put in four years squaring for that mistake. Let's start again, Mr. Tesro. You say you were in Cincinnati in 1931. Okay, Mr. Wolf. three candidates and we're still on the one-yard line. Our one-yard line. Tesoro McLean Tinsley. No, no, rule out McLean. He gave references enough for those years in China. And with Helen Tunis, he's got the one firm alibi we've laid on to. Caffrey was killed before midnight. With conditions as they are in the Far East, Archie, it would be weeks before cables came back on McLean's claims. Uh, claims? You figure the whole Chinese background's a fake? I want you to see Miss Tunis again, Archie. Taking all precautions for her safety. And this is one time I give you permission to ply her with all the attentions you can contrive. <laughs> Are we far enough to pull tails on any of these three? I've got Saul Panza on Tesro, and Saul promised to have men on Tinsley and McLean. Pictures of the three have gone to Kramer for circulation in the South. Oh, no answer yet from the coast on Tinsley, huh? Not yet. For the moment, Archie, you'll concentrate on Helen Tunis. Helen, I've got to see you tonight. I'd love to, Archie, Now, look, but... Helen, I phoned you to come out in the corridor this way because I didn't want McLean to know we're talking. Do you still say you got that new mink coat on your own money? Mr. Goodwin, I don't know what right you Helen, have Helen, if you to... get five guys to buy your stuff, it's your business, Mr. But... McLean said his wife might be sending detectives around. Well, you can go right back to your old Mrs. McLean and tell easy, her that I... Easy, Helen, easy. He was dictating to me. You know, baby, the harder you lie, the prettier you look. <laughs> but if this is a fake alibi and if you keep propping it up, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Bad trouble. Now, how about it? Do I see you at your apartment tonight, or would you rather come down with me to Nero Wolf's right now? Archie, I... All right. I can't go with you now, and I've got a dinner date with my aunt tonight that I can't break, but I'll try to be back at my apartment by 11. Archie! Near Wolf's being. Sergeant, Mr. Wolf, I'm in Helen Tunis' apartment. Well? I could cut my throat for not making her come with me this afternoon. Trouble? Not for her anymore, poor kid. I got here three minutes ago and found her strangled. Couldn't have happened more than half an hour ago. McLean. McLean. Didn't Saul Panzer say he was getting a tail on him? He was a new man and he lost him. I should have left you on McLean, Archie. Yeah, we were both wrong. What do you want me to do? Phone the police immediately. 32nd Street, I'm 
I'm only three blocks and a job from the office. What if I come back and call from there? Come back, then. I'll phone Kramer myself. Mr. Wolf, I'm still kicking myself for that. Look out, Archie. Too late, Mr. Wolf. Keep coming right in, Goodwin. With your hands up. No, I wouldn't try that. McLean. And keep your hand out of that desk drawer, Wolf. This time you're too late, McLean. My hand's in the drawer, and I think I'll leave it there. You don't think I'd shoot? I'm sure you would. But you've got two of us to cover now. No, Archie, don't try to draw yet. How'd you get in here, McLean? He surprised me after making his way in through the area way below, and of course, it had to be Fritz's night out. I caught your fat friend just two seconds before he could get in his call to the police, Goodwin. I overheard his talk with you from the hallway here. My apologies for not crying out sooner, Archie. Get your hand out of that drawer. Pull it out without the gun, Wolf, or I'll let you have it now. I refuse to, McLean. Seems obvious that you mean to kill us in any case. I'm afraid that's true, Wolf. But when you called me here and Goodwin started making dates with Helen Tunis... Poor kid, I told her not to talk to you. She didn't, Goodwin. I've been scared of you and Wolf since I followed Colby here that first night. Colby? You knew him as Caffrey. I caught up with him afterward in that subway washroom. No, keep that hand up and watch that gun of yours, Wolf. When I found that envelope on him and read the letter to you contained in it, I knew he hadn't spilled the whole South Carolina story to you. South Carolina? Would the original knifing have been taking place anywhere near Hampton or Jasper Countess? Hampton County. But our business is over the line in Georgia. It doesn't matter now. Uh, pity, Archie. We learned this afternoon that we were growing warm on South Carolina. Mr. McLean, may I ask what you hope to achieve by this insane project of disposing of Mr. Goodwin and myself? I'm buying time, Wolf. I've 90,000 in small bills in that bag there, plus a plane ticket to Buenos Aires. I've got a silencer on this gun. If you two aren't found till tomorrow morning, I'll be out of the country before they start looking for me. You don't think the police will put out an alarm for you when they find the body of Helen Tunis? Goodwin left it to you to report that, Remember? Let's remind ourselves to be prompter on reporting death, Sachi. Starting with our own, Mr. Wolf. Glad you can take it that way, Goodwin. You actually think you can knock the two of us off? I'm about to find out, Goodwin. One moment, McLean. You've never been a real gambler. You know that. With marked cards, of course. But you're not the man to face a sure loss now. A sure loss? The loss of your life. Within seconds after you try to pull that trigger. I told you I had a silencer. You think anyone will hear the shots? There will be more shots than you count on. My hand's on a pistol now in this drawer, and Mr. Goodwin has a thirty-eight in his shoulder holster. You can't shoot through the desk, and Goodwin won't get a chance to draw. You're an intelligent man, McLean. Vicious, but intelligent. May I describe the certainty of your immediate death... If you don't throw that pistol on the desk and give yourself up... There are two of you, I know that, but... McLean, you must be aware that in the actual fact, exceedingly few men are killed instantly by a single shot, even from a pistol of heavy caliber. The one you hold is a thirty-two, And it's a forty-five in that drawer, McLean. I assure you, McLean, that neither of us will surrender the weapons we have. Should you start shooting... We'll both do our best to draw and keep firing till you're dead. You're stalling, Wolf. What have I got to lose by trying for you both now? Your life? I'll correct that. The loss of some six or eight weeks of your life, possibly months. Whatever the time necessary to bring you to trial and to convict you and execute you for the murders you've committed. Suppose I cancel you out and then take my chances with Goodwin. A better choice, but still a dubious one. I'm fat, exceedingly fat. And for perhaps the first time in my life, I'm thoroughly grateful for that. My bulk affects the calculation, McLean. McLean, you could pull off all seven shots and still not hit Mr. Wolf where it counts. You have to start, you better start on me. You exaggerate, Archie, and I thank you for the gallantry of it. No, it's quite likely that with two or three shots, McLean might well dispose of me, but not uh, with your first shot, McLean, and we'll not permit you many more than your first. Look, if I promise to do no more than tie you two up to give me my head start, will you toss in your guns? Of course not. Do I speak for us both, Archie? Check. I say let's start it now. Uh, Wolf, if I give you half of what's in that bag, would you forget these admissions I've made and help on my defense? I've told you I refuse to bargain. 
I think that I shall count five. If your weapon hasn't been tossed on the desk by then, I'll do my best to get my pistol into action. Are you in accord, Archie? Start counting. Wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. One. If I trade half that bag for no shooting and one hour's start, no tying up, just your promise that... Two. All the bag for a half hour start, 90,000. Three. Are you ready, Archie? All set, sir. Uh, except if you're the one who walks out of this, call up every number in my little red book, huh? And tell each girl I was thinking of her just before you got the five. Agreed. I resume four. Okay. You win. Holy sweet Susan, it worked. It worked. A commendable choice, McLean, for us at least. You see, I'm afraid I forgot to mention one slight factor which might have operated in your favor. What's that, boss? I must confess, Archie, that my forty-five is in the upstairs den where I took it to oil it last night. Holy cow, you didn't have a gun? Why, you dirty... Take it easy, McLean. I've really got one. Oh, by the way, Mr. Wolf, <laughs> signals off on those women, huh? When my heart gets back down out of my throat, I'll call them myself. I'll trouble you for a beer first, Archie. And then if you'll be good enough to phone Inspector Kramer, you can bid him pick up his triple murderer. The one-time cutter of cards. Fortunately for us, who's never been a real gambler. <laughs> ah, I've been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin and Lorraine Carter, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, Herb Butterfield, and Vic Rodman. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Phantom Fingers. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Would you like a shout-out? Leave a comment in the section below. Tell me who you want to shout out to, who you want to shout out from, and we'll get it up here for you. Hey, we want to say thanks for tuning in. Please like and subscribe so you don't miss any. you got a lot more of these up there. Go check them out under the playlist. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you want to see, what you think, and we'll see you next time.